Now, you might be wondering, why the book of Romans, why this particular application in the book of Romans to start us off with this sermon series? And the answer to that question is, as a church, we are in year number 51. And the theme for the year, the overarching theme of the year is two words. Does everybody know what it is? It's on the t-shirts. I'll give you a clue. It is? Woo, okay, we'll just do that again, all right? The theme for the year is? Never stop. That's right, never stop. The same faith that it took to start our church 50 years ago is the same faith that's required for our church to continue to move forward into the future. And if we are going to accomplish all that God has in store for us, especially when it comes to reaching people and loving people and discipling people, then we better have our facts straight because truth matters. You know, the reality is we live in a world that is in desperate need of truth. If you Google the biggest questions of life, you know what you're going to find? Where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Where am I going? At some point in all of our lives, we are all going to ask ourselves those same questions. And you know what is absolutely tragic is that we live in a world today where many people believe that there is no absolute truth. And that statement in and of itself, not only is it sad, not only is it tragic, it's absolutely absurd. And the reason why is because that statement in and of itself is an absolute statement. If there is no absolute truth, you're saying something that's absolute right there, right off the bat. And the only logical question to follow up with is, well, What makes that statement more absolute than any other statement? And you know where they're going to follow back up with? Well, there are no absolutes except for this absolute and all the other absolutes that are necessary to support this absolute. So in essence, what you are saying is there is truth. It does not take long when you get into a conversation with somebody to come to the conclusion that there absolutely is truth truth that is absolute, that is the same for all people of all times, in all ages, in all days. And that leads us to the big question that we have to answer. Well, what is truth? What is truth? I believe with all my heart that truth is God's reality without error. That's what truth is. Truth is God's reality without error. And it's been revealed to us generally through creation. How many of you believe that the heavens declare the glory of God? I believe that this world is a world of design and order. I was thinking about it this morning as I was taking a walk. Alana and I, we get up every morning and we walk. And one thing that has become a crystal clear to me over the past several weeks and while I'm praying and while I'm worshiping, because by the way, the mornings are absolutely beautiful. It's always hot in Florida, but it's a little bit cooler in the morning. And we typically are catching the sunrise. And this morning, the sky was particularly beautiful. And I just walk and I worship and I praise God. And one of the things that has become crystal clear is that in subdivisions in Milton, Florida, there are chickens and there are roosters. Give it up for Milton, Florida right there. I love it. And you know what? Those roosters are loud every single morning. But you know what I've been reminded of the past several weeks every time I hear those things? And there's a couple different yards that have roosters in them. Those things are crowing at the top of their lungs. And you know what? I thank God for his faithfulness. I thank God that that sun rises every single day, that it is something that you can count on. It is something constant and consistent. And you know what? I think it takes way more faith to believe that all of this just happened by chance. All of this happened by accident. Then then, then it takes to believe that there is a God. There is a designer who brought all of this into existence. I took a little bit of a rabbit trail there because it's extremely important that we understand that. Let me go back to the definition of truth. Okay, Truth is God's reality without error, revealed to man generally through creation and specifically through his word. The beauty of this book is it fills in all of the blanks. Those questions that I mentioned at the beginning of our service Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? This book answers those questions beautifully and perfectly because it tells us who our God is. And you know what I love specifically about the book of Romans and where we're going in our study today is that Romans is a book all about God. It's a book that's all about God, how he acted to bring salvation. Are you thankful that God acted to bring salvation to mankind? It's a book that's about how he acted to bring salvation, 
how his justice is preserved by forgiving sins. We're going to talk about that, how his purposes are worked out in history, and a big, huge wow, how he can be served by his people. Not only did God act throughout history to save us, he's also given us a purpose. He wants us to be a part of his plan and what he is doing in this world. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. So it's especially important that we get our facts straight because truth matters. And that leads me to title number one of our message this morning, which is this, the gospel 101. The gospel 101. The book of Romans is many things, and one of those many things that it is is Paul's um, fullest explanation of the gospel. And he begins right away in his introduction. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So are you ready to dive in? Okay, three of you are. Are you ready to dive in this morning? There we go. Okay, here we go. Number one, introductions matter. Here's point number one, introductions matter. Uh, Just give you a little bit of context. Romans is by far the longest letter that Paul writes. Now, we call them books of the Bible, but the New Testament is filled with epistles, letters that Paul wrote to the churches that were scattered throughout the world at that time. And Romans is by far the longest epistle, the longest letter that he writes out of any of his letters. It contains 7,114 words. So if you're going to have a long book, you also get a long introduction. This is the longest introduction that he has out of any of his books. And it's extremely important to understand that he takes a little bit extra time with the introduction because he is introducing himself to a church that is full of people that he had never met before. And he's introducing him to himself to a church that he did not found. So he's never been to Rome. He's never been to this church. He doesn't know who these people are. They don't necessarily know who he is. And so it's very important that he establishes his credentials, who he is, and why we should listen to what he has to say. How many of you think that's pretty important before you jump into a book? Who is this guy that's talking to us, and why does it matter? Why should I listen to what he's saying? So let's answer question number one. Who is Paul? Look at verse one of Romans chapter one. Verse one says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Let's just stop right there. That word for servant is a very strong word. It could also be translated slave. Paul views himself as being legally owned by Jesus Christ. That means that his purposes, his livelihood, everything that he does in life is all completely determined by Jesus Christ and what Jesus says to do. That's a good picture of what it means to be surrendered to the Lord, of taking up your cross. It means that I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am legally owned by him. Whatever you say, wherever you want me to go, however you want me to live, I am yours. I am yours. That's who Paul is. So he begins with Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Then he says, called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. Now, we got to unpack this just for a minute. Paul was called to be an apostle. Does anybody know what Paul's name before it was Paul, what his given name was as a child? It was Saul. And Saul just happened to be One of the greatest enemies that the church has ever known. Saul was a devout religious man. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he saw Jesus Christ as a threat to Judaism and to his religion. And as a result of that, he was filled with a zeal to stop the threat of Jesus and his followers. And so he became the number one persecutor in all of the church. Paul was on the road to Damascus to go persecute the Christians that were in Damascus. And while he is on his way traveling there, a voice from heaven calls out to him and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He denied the very existence of who Jesus was. And yet here is Jesus himself, risen again from the grave, ruling and reigning in power and authority. And he literally calls Saul on the road to Damascus And says, why are you persecuting me when I'm alive and real and I'm standing right in front of you? And you know what happened on that road that day? Saul got gloriously saved, but he also had a call that was placed on his life to be an apostle. And so Paul here is claiming to be part of a very special group of people that were chosen by God for the historical role of founding the church. When Paul says, I'm called to be an apostle, that meant something. One of Paul's unique roles as an apostle of Jesus Christ 
was giving of scripture. One of, his, one of the unique ways that God used him was he gave him divine revelation. We call it inspiration. And God breathed the very words into Paul. Paul penned them on paper. And so this book of Romans is actually not Paul's words, but it's actually the words that God gave to Paul to write to the church in Rome. So how many of you think it's important to listen, not to Paul, but to what God has to say to us through an instrument a man by the name of Paul. So that's who Paul is. Paul is called to be an apostle. One other thing at the end of that verse, it says, Paul is servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Everybody out loud, that last phrase, it is separated unto the gospel of God. Paul was selected. He was assigned to the gospel. You know what that means? His job was to take the good news of Jesus to a world that's in desperate need of good news. Truth matters, right? Right? We have been selected and assigned by God. We're going to see that in just a little bit. I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we have been selected and assigned by God to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We better have our facts straight because the world is in need of hope and we have the answer and the answer is Jesus and it's found in him. So that's who Paul is. All right. Question number two. Why should we listen? Why should we listen to what he has to say? Well, look at Well, the end of verse one, I kind of glossed over it, but I want to come back to it. He says, he's separated unto the gospel of who? The gospel is God's idea. That's why we should listen. The gospel was God's idea. The gospel, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, how Jesus became a man. And he came to this earth to go to a cross to die because we are sinners and the punishment for sin was death. And on the cross, he took our place. He took your place and my place and he died and he was buried. But death did not hold him there. Death did not defeat him because on the third day, he rose again from the grave. The gospel is the good news about how we can become his children and how we can put our faith and trust in Jesus, all because of what he did for us on the cross and how he defeated sin, hell, and the grave. And all of that was God's idea. All of that was God's idea. Paul, nor any other man, did not invent the gospel. God invented the gospel. By the way, look at verse 2. It says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This was not a new idea. This was not something that was brand new. It's like, oh yeah, the Old Testament wasn't working, so we need something new in the New Testament. That's not it at all. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, the first book of the Bible. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, you have the very first mention of the gospel. You have hope in spite of our failures. And the Bible tells us that before God even formed the earth, he knew that we would be broken. He knew that we would sin. He knew that we would mess up. And he devised his plan of salvation, which was always that his son Jesus would at one point come and die on the cross to pay for our sins. So this is his idea, and it's not a new idea. Now, the gospel is glorious. Look at verses 3 and 4. I'm going to go through this as quick as I can because we could unpack these verses for a month if we wanted to. There's so much doctrine here. But he says in verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. All right, the gospel's glorious. You got several things here. You all ready for a big doctrinal term this morning? Have any of you ever heard of the hypostatic union? You all are like, it's Sunday. School is Monday. Give me a break on Sunday, okay? (laughs) The hypostatic union, all that means is that God was 100% man, that Jesus was 100% man, and he was 100% God. You see that in both verses three and four. In verse three, it says that he was the seed of David. God, Jesus, was born in the most miraculous way. He was born of a virgin, and he became a literal man in the flesh. But you know what else he was? He never lost his deity. He was always still the Son of God. And I love what verse 4 says. And declared to be the Son of God with, what's that next word? Power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In those two verses, you have all of the gospel. You have the fact that Jesus was a man, that he was born of a virgin of the seed of David. And then after he died and he rose again from the grave, he was declared to be the son of God with power. I want that to sit in for just a minute, to sink in for just a minute. I want you to sit on that. 
When I think about how desperate our world is for truth today, it overwhelms me. Man, when I think about trying to convince the skeptics, when I think about trying to convince my neighbors that they need to be saved, or I think about trying to convince people that may be sitting here today that are lost, I feel the, the burden of all of that. But you, do you understand that it's not our job to convince people? The Holy Spirit does that. He's the one who moves and works. And, and the gospel is glorious because Jesus is being declared through the spirit of holiness with power. All we have to do is lift high the name of Jesus. All we have to do is point people to the gospel of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit takes it from there. And he does a whole lot better than you and I could ever do at calling people to themselves, opening up their eyes, showing him who they are. And the gospel has the power to save and transform lives. The gospel is glorious. And it is at work in our world today. All right, so you ready for a practical application from all of that? Look at verse 5. Uh, here's the practical application. Let me just give it to you. It might sound a little bit familiar. It's going to be the third week in a row that we've had this same application. Never stop obeying. You're like, okay, Pastor Mike, well, you're done with Joshua. The never stop applications. Okay, that was our last sermon series. And we talked a lot about obedience. I mean, Joshua was hammering obedience home over and over again. And here we are in a brand new book in the New Testament. And look at what we run into in verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Everybody read those next five verses out loud together with me. For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Here Paul is saying... The reason why I've been given this special gift of apostleship, the reason why God called me on the road to Damascus, the reason why he made me an apostle to the Gentiles to go share the good news is for obedience to the faith among all nations. If you want to sum it up for the glory of his name, nothing brings glory to God like his people living in obedience to him. You might be asking, wondering this morning, well, what exactly is obedience to the faith? I want to say something, and I want to say it very clearly. Obedience and faith are not the same things. The Bible tells us that by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. There is absolutely nothing that you and I can do to save ourselves. And how many of you say a good, loud, huge amen to that fact? I, I do. The Bible tells us that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. No matter how hard I try, I'm always going to fall short because I am a broken sinner. We are all broken sinners. And there's not a work of righteousness that we could ever do to earn our salvation. Salvation is 100% completely by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. So what is obedience to the faith? Faith that honors God always involves obedience. And obedience that honors God always involves faith. God's not up in heaven this morning clapping and cheering and saying, good job, you showed up to church this morning, you didn't want to, but I'm just so glad you're here, you get a point. It's not how it works. <laughs> Honestly, if you don't want to be here, you're not doing any good by even being here. God wants you to be here because of faith, because you're excited to worship him and you're excited to sing about a holy God and you're excited about praising him for the works that he has done and your heart's filled with thanksgiving and gratitude for who he is. So faith that honors God always is going to involve obedience, but obedience that honors God will always involve faith. You know what? That starts the moment that we get saved. When God calls you, when he speaks in your ear and he says, hey, listen, you're a sinner there's nothing you can do to save yourself. I did it all for you on the cross. I died, and I want to make you my child, and I want to make you a brand new creation in Christ. When he starts calling and he starts speaking in your ear like that, faith responds with obedience by believing on the Lord Jesus, and you are saved. And you know what happens? We recognize that he is the Lord and master of our life. And that is what it's all about, that we submit ourselves, that we say the same thing that Paul says, I, Mike, am a servant of Jesus Christ. He owns me. He's my master. He's my Lord. He is my Savior. I am submitted to him in every single way. Faith obeys and submits ourselves to God. And it begins at salvation, 
and it continues to grow as we live our life in obedience and faith. And by the way, that is the most reasonable thing that we could ever do with our lives because if he loved us enough to die for us, do you think that he wants to lead us astray in our obedience to him? No, he wants to lead us to a life of blessing and fulfillment, so never stop obeying. Love the Lord your God. Serve the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his commandments. Cleave unto him. All of those same things that we talked about. Live in obedience to the faith. Introductions matter. I'll just read you verse 6, and this is why, well, this is the whole point of what Paul's getting at is, as glorious as his testimony is, look what he says about us in verses 6 and 7, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. He's saying, you're called just like I am. And he says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a high and holy calling that's found in him. Introductions matter. Number two, people matter. People matter. Our slogan that's up on the hallway out there, love God, love others. The two greatest commandments in all the world, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You want to talk about the gospel 101? People matter. Man, you see this coming out of Paul's heart. Look at verse 8. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. What a testimony of the people at the church of Rome. Their faith was spoken of them throughout the whole world. Why? Well, do you know where the persecution of Christians began? In Rome, under Nero. Nero was ruling and reigning at that time. To be a Christian inside of Rome was not the easiest thing to do. And because of their faith in Jesus Christ and because of the living conditions and the temperature of, of what it meant to be a believer at that time, their faith was spoken of throughout all the world. And you know what we need to do? All of these points are practical application, by the way. People matter. Thank God for people. Here Paul is, and he's thanking God for the church in Rome and for their testimony. Can I tell you this morning that wouldn't it be awesome if we um, would be thankful for the Christians in India the same way that Paul was thankful for the Christians in Rome? Man, I think about Ningwong, and I think about the, the people that we just gave to this morning, and I think about where they're at. Did y'all notice their living conditions? I mean, in that video, like, how many of you would like to share a room with 15 of your closest friends? I mean, you get to sit close to each other for like an hour, but then we get to go home to our space and get back into our own little bubble. How many of you got like bubbles? Like, don't get in my bubble. Stay out of that. Don't invade my space and my territory. Man, I'm thankful for the believers that are serious enough about their faith in Jesus Christ that it doesn't matter. I'll live and I'll serve in that type of condition because I want to know more and I want to take the gospel. Thank God for people. That's what we do. We get encouraged by one another. Look at verse 9. Pray for people, pray for people, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. What a verse. Paul saying, for God is my witness, that without ceasing, I pray for you. Now, I think it would be absolutely awesome. I think it's great that we came down and we gave money this morning to that project and that we're going to be giving money to missions throughout this whole year. But sometimes God lays specific people and places on your heart. And it would be awesome if in a year from now, if somehow we, we saw Ningwan or maybe you were able to write him a letter and you could say, as God is my witness, without ceasing, I prayed for you. And I prayed for your work in India. I, I think that that's that's only right and something that should be a part of our lives, that we pray for people outside of even what's here, certain people around the world. We can't play, pray for the whole world just generally, pray that the world would be saved, but we can pray for specific people around the world and ministries around the world, and that's what Paul's doing here in this passage. I, I think about some other missionaries that we have here, and I think they're actually here this morning. Did Matt and Delita make it in this morning? Yeah, there they are in the back. They're back there with the gardeners who we also um, are, are partnering with them down at Hope Children's Home right on their property. I, I think of Matt and Delita. I know Matt and Delita. There are many people here in this church that could come up to you and say, as God is my witness, without ceasing, we've been praying. They've been going through a trial of their faith that has been stretched to the limits and the max. Pray for people. 
God gave his son for people. And when we get saved, we become part of the family of God. This was awesome. Actually, uh, this morning, I don't even know this guy right here. We met just a little while ago. <laughs> Robert, Joe Ash was here, and he's like looking around. He's like, where's my family? And he said, look around you. You got the family of God that's right here with you. And I was like, that's my kind of guy. He's got this down pat. He knows it. <laughs> There's a bond that we have in Christ. And we ought to be praying for one another. It should not, should not just be words, but, but we ought to be praying because we need people to pray for us and others need us to pray for them because our faith will be tried and our faith will be stretched and this world does need the gospel of Jesus Christ and he uses us and we ought to be burdened about others to the point that we're willing to pray without ceasing, with that type of a burden that God would continue to move and work. Then long for people. So Paul thanked God for people. He prayed for people, longed for people. Look at verse 11. Oh, actually, before I go on, i got to give you a practical application of that. Not only do we pray for other people around the world, we got to pray for each other here. On um, this Friday, my wife is starting a prayer group this year. It's called Women Who Pray. Go ahead and put that slide up. Yeah, there it is, Women Who Pray. And they're going to be meeting on the first and third Sat, uh, Friday of every month. They're going to be meeting at 8 a.m. They're going to be meeting in the loft here on our property. And the specific purpose of this prayer group is for moms and grandmothers and aunts and just ladies in general to come and to pray specifically for the next generation, for the students in our school. How many of you believe that Satan's trying to warp their minds, trying to lead them away from truth? We're praying that God's word would be alive. We need to pray for our students and the people here in this ministry. On Saturday, this Saturday, we're having a men's prayer breakfast. On the first Saturday of every month, as we go throughout the next several months, we're going to be having men's prayer breakfasts. We need to pray for each other, men. Satan is trying to attack our families. He's trying to destroy the home. He's trying to attack you specifically as the leader of your home. And we need one another. We need to set aside our pride. And we need to go and we need to build relationships. But we need to pray and get to know each other and pray with one another so that we can be strengthened and encouraged in our walk with Christ. We need to be people of prayer. We need to get a hold of God. So pray for people. These are some things that are starting this week. Next is long for people. Look at verse 11. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. As awesome as this church's testimony was, they also needed some strengthening. They had some problems in this church. There was a lack of unity. Oh, that's a shock to everybody, right? The church was divided. The Jews and the Gentile Christians were not getting along with each other, and Paul was really concerned about solving that problem, so he was longing to be there to establish unity amongst the brothers. But look what he says in verse 12. This is so good. The balance that's here. He says, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. This is huge. Paul wanted to get there and share his gifts with these believers and to strengthen them and establish them. But he also said, but I also need to be comforted and strengthened by you. This is how God created the Christian life to be. It's reciprocal. As you serve others, others serve you. As you minister to others, others minister to you. And you might be sitting here thinking, I don't know how I could possibly minister. I'm new in the faith or I don't know anything. Listen. You are called by God to get to know other people and even your very testimony, even the very basics of what you know, but your hunger for God could minister to somebody who's maybe become complacent. My whole point is as a believer, we have a responsibility one to another and nobody's exempt from that. The apostle Paul, let me say that again. The apostle Paul <laughs> says that I need to be strengthened and encouraged by other believers in the faith. If he needs to be, you and I certainly need to be. Guess what? We have another awesome opportunity that's coming up. Um, we have three new connect groups that are starting. Um, two tonight, one on Tuesday night. We're just going to go ahead and put that up on the screen real quick. God's been growing our church. But can I tell you that, that connect groups are not just some neat idea to fill up your schedule that's not busy at all, right? No one's, no one's busy in here. We all got extra time and uh, are looking for something to do. No, listen, these things are necessities. When God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, it's so that we can exhort one another. It's so that we can provoke one another unto love and to good works. It's so what Paul's saying here in verses 11 and 12 can be lived out in our lives on a regular basis. We have a responsibility to take next steps to get connected with one another. 
so that we can pray for one another and we can bear one another's burdens. So long for people, long for people, and long to be the person that God wants you to be. I don't know what just happened here, but my notes went out. And then next, hold on just a second. You gotta love technology, right? That was awkward, right? <laughs> All right, I'm going right back down here, picking up where I left. Someone, see, this is, this is it. This is exactly what I need. Someone told me last week, they're like, you don't have any notes. You never need notes. And I was like, oh, I got notes. I do practice as much as I can, and I do know where I'm going, but I also need to have them in front of me sometimes, or else I, I will lose my train of thought. So here it is, proof that I do use notes, and I have them in here. All right, so long for people. And last is plan for people. Plan for people. Look at verse 13. He says, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. The thing that I love about Paul, and I'll just sum it all up with this, this whole point on people, is Paul always was dreaming about people and more ways to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here he is, he had never been to Rome, but he's dying to go to Rome. He wants to go and he wants to preach the gospel to them, to the lost people that are there. His heart is burdened about it and he's planning to go. But up to this point, God had not allowed him to yet. But one day he's going to make it there, not in the way that he thought. He's going to make it there in chains and he's going to be able to preach the gospel in Rome, but in a completely different way than he ever thought. But the whole point can be summed up with this because of what God did in Paul's life. He was burdened about other people, and he didn't just long for them in general. He actually planned, and he had specific ideas and goals of how he was going to get there and how he's going to reach them. And in God's timing, it all worked out. We're not going to reach people by accident. We're not going to change our lives and grow in obedience to the faith by accident. We've got to put plan, and then we've got to put action to the plans, and we've got to take those next steps and be obedient and be everything that God wants us to to be. So people matter. And last but not least is evangelism matters. The gospel 101. Introductions matter. We know that the gospel is God's idea. Evangelism, I mean, uh, people matter. And here, evangelism matters. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul's using language that they would understand when he's talking about he's a debtor to the Greeks and the barbarians, the Roman people would understand. The Romans and the Greeks thought that they were higher and more intellectual and better than the barbarians. And Paul's just eliminating all of those barriers right off the bat. He says, it doesn't matter who you are, what, where you came from in life. I am in debt to everybody and I can't wait to get to Rome to be able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though it may cost me my life, I am burdened for others. And here's the practical application about evangelism and what, why it matters. You know what is true of all of us? We are all debtors. When it comes to the gospel, we are all debtors. I have a $100 bill here. Saban, come get this $100 bill. You don't get to keep it, though. You have to give it back. I know what it'll try to do. If I give Saban this $100 and I tell Saban to go give it to his Uncle Dave. Nah, let's give it to Aunt Patty. She's the one that needed it. No, don't do it yet. If I tell him to take the $100 and go give it to his uncle over here, Saban instantly becomes a debtor, right? That $100 is not for him to keep. It's not for him to put it in his back pocket. It's not for him to teach. He is a debtor until he gets that $100 to the person who it's assigned to, the person that it's required for. You can go sit back down. Give me the $100 back. Thank you. I, I show that to illustrate to you that when we were given the gospel, we were given it with all of its benefits. It changes our life, absolutely. But we were also given the gospel not to keep for ourselves, but to give out and to share with others, which means that I am a debtor. I am in debt. And I'm in debt to the the God of heaven that gave me the responsibility of reaching, of, of sharing his gospel with others. And I cannot just keep it to myself. My responsibility as a child of God is to share the good news with others. And make no mistake about it. Mark this down. I am in disobedience to God if I am not sharing the good news with others. 
How in the world could I keep something so amazing and something so life-changing silent and to myself? And it's almost as if Paul knows where we're going in our minds because look how he ends this introduction. He says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We are debtors, but we are also not ashamed. And that's what Paul says, for I am not ashamed. And to make a statement like that means that at some point along the line, he was tempted to be ashamed. And I know at first when Paul heard about Jesus, Jesus he despised the whole idea of the gospel. He despised the whole idea of who the gospel of who Jesus was. But at some point after God called him and set him apart, he made up his mind a long time ago that Christ would be magnified in his body whether it be by life or by death. And here he's boldly and loudly proclaiming, "I am not ashamed of the gospel." Can you and I say the same thing? When I think about Sharing the gospel of others. Have, have any of you ever felt ashamed to open your mouth and to share the good news of Jesus with somebody else? Isn't it amazing how we can talk about our sports teams and we can talk about all kinds of crazy things that happen in life. We can even share our political views unashamed. And it doesn't matter who we offend, but why is it that when it comes to Jesus, the one who went to the cross, the one who died to save us, that we keep our mouths shut? How is it that we go about our, our, our days in our weeks, and very rarely ever open our mouth to tell somebody about Jesus or to invite somebody to church or to let people know who God is. I think one reason why so many people don't trust the church, and by the way, if you look at statistics, those numbers are growing in our country today. They don't trust the church because they don't really ultimately see anything that's different about us. Yeah, they see some people that come in and sing some songs and look nice on a Sunday morning. But when we go out about our weeks, what's really different? And are we burdened about others to the point that we're not ashamed to point them to Jesus Christ, to the Savior of the world, the one who gave all for them? This is where we're going in this book. This is just how Paul sets it up. Truth matters, right? We've got to get our facts straight. And right off the bat, the Gospel 101, it's all about people. It's all about what God's called me to. It's all about I'm beloved of God. I'm a saint. I'm separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And he's left me in this world and he's made me a debtor to everybody else who does not know Jesus Christ as their savior. And so as much as in me is, I need to be burdened about sharing that good news. And I've got to stand in front of others and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know why? It's the power of God unto salvation. And you know where we need to start, maybe if we're gonna get over being ashamed? It's maybe we're not experiencing the power of the gospel like we should. You know, that, that word salvation, it's an active word. You, you put your faith in Jesus and he saves you at that moment, but he continually saves you. It doesn't stop. He's continually saving you, which means that as we obey, as we live in obedience to the faith, Guess what he's doing? He is continually saving and transforming us. He wants to save you minute by minute, day by day, trial by trial, temptation by temptation. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why? Because of the power of the gospel that lives inside of me. We don't have excuses to succumb to the temptations. We don't have excuses to let the weight of life's struggles keep us down. No, we've got to get our eyes fixed back on Jesus and we've got to get back up and we've got to keep moving forward by faith because the power of the gospel saves. And if God's transforming and changing your life like that, Nobody's going to be able to keep you quiet. And your life will shout loud and clear who God is.